السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ وعلیکم السلام و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ یا حج یس یس برادر افتاب الحاج ہاؤ یو ڈوئنگ برو حال ہم سے الحمدللہ الحمدللہ ہاو ار یو یا کون کمپلین ما برو کون کمپلین من جس تھنک یو حال وین واز دا لاسٹ ٹائم وی ونٹ آن حج برو وی ونٹ آن حج um i actually don't know i actually don't know. maybe 10 years ago i don't man yeah it feels like a long time but you know what you know what we'll come to hajj what i wanted to start off with bro is uh the talk about you know talk briefly about the the blessed 10 days of dhul hijjah because our beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam You know, he told us that there's no there are no days greater in the sight of Allah and in which righteous deeds are more beloved to him than these 10 days so during this time recite a great deal of tahleel i you know uh, there is no god but Allah takbir tahmid you know and and the reason why i want to mention this bro afi is because i don't know about you but growing up and i even get a, a feeling uh, that this is the case now as well that You know when it comes to Ramadan uh, it's in our mind is fixated that yeah you know what this month is blessed um and we do what we got to do right but when it comes to the month of Dhul Hijjah um not not a lot of us know actually uh, about the, the you know the virtues of the the first 10 days and I think it's important that uh, people do know because it's it's such a, a huge loss if the if the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is telling us that these 10 days are the best You know, imagine, imagine losing that, imagine losing out on that. Yeah, subhanAllah, you know, um, I was listening to um, a little talk, uh, a video that was on YouTube by um, Dr. Zakir Naik on, on this uh, very topic. And, uh, you know, for someone who's learned in Islam, as he is, he was saying that, you know, we grow up, and everyone talks about the virtues of ramadan mm. uh, but no one talks about virtues about i mean generally the, there are other days throughout the year as well but especially these first 10 days of dhul hijjah and if i'm honest with you even while we were on the hajj um uh you know you could tell there's something pre- special about the build up to yeah. hajj anyway but even then mm. You know, we weren't told that actually these days in the build up to Hajj, as in the mm. first 10 days of the month, that there's some something special about these. And it, it, if I'm honest, I think it was like, it was in recent times that you come across this and as though you come across it by chance uh, when, you, when you're going and looking and reading into the issue that you find out that these virtues, but you're right, you know, people, people don't talk about it. Yeah, I mean, you know... Uh... I came across a narration. I'm not sure entirely how authentic it is. It will be. Uh, uh, it will be authentic. But it was talking about how, you know, it's it's recommended to. It's definitely recommended to fast on the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, which is the day of Arafat, right? Uh, but to to it's recommended also to fast the first nine days. Um, and the, and from what I was reading is that each day is like equivalent to a year's fasting. So you know, some highlights. It's truly amazing how much, how much blessings and how much uh, ajr that we have available to us. But, uh, you know, it, this is something which uh, I myself, you know, with the kids and stuff like that, try to explain to them that, look, these 10 days, they are different. You know, we'll recite the Quran and we'll, you know, have a different type of mindset because, you know, elders don't know about it. Forget children. Uh, and uh, as much as we can do, I think it's important to, to, you know, spread the message about the blessed days of, of the hijjah uh, yeah, i mean I, i i've got a little theory on uh, why these days are, are not talked about but before we come to that i think mm. you know uh, like i said when i was uh, when i was reading and uh, you know learning more about the days of the hijjah uh, and you know dr zaki like again on the video I, i recommend everyone reads it because you know the, um, the brother is a very learned brother and some the way he articulates things is very very good and he was saying that look you know there's a the debate amongst those people who have looked into this issue and looked into the evidences are saying that look, you know there's comparisons with the last 10 days of hajj where the 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 evidence talks about the virtues of the last 10 nights 
You know about Ramadan. And the, the last ten, uh, about, last ten Ramadan, nights of Ramadan. Yeah. last 10 nights of ramadan where the the blessing is is, is massive and then when you talk about uh, and the evidence on the last uh, on the first 10 days days of dhul hijjah are not in contradiction to this because here is talking about the virtues of the days so you got the virtue of the days of dhul hijjah <coughs> and the virtues of the nights of ramadan yeah 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 you fast you fasting bro uh, it sounds like you know you got a bit of a, a sore throat Well, okay, I'll let you. I'll let just, you. Uh, no, no, cool, man. No, cool, carry on. Sorry, right. he's just yeah, uh, no, talking, no. talking too much. No, no, that's it, man. Uh, but it's good. I like to hear what you got to say. But okay, let, let's move on then, because Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, uh, I'm speaking to a a serial Haji, um, someone who <laughs> I think you've been Hajj three times. Yeah, I've been three times. Subhanallah, and that's why uh, I called you Al Hajj, yeah, in the plural, bro. Alhamdulillah. Uh, just a bit of a background, you know. Me and uh, brother Afi, um, we've been to uh, on Hajj and Umrah a few times. Uh, brother Afi's been Hajj three times. Uh, I've been twice, uh, as well as twice in Ramadan as well. And every time I've been, I've been with brother Afi, so we have that connection there, which uh, is always going to be there. Um, but bro, listen. There's so much to speak about. Hajj. Yeah, go on. Go yeah, on, go on. Like you know, I, I've had the uh, I've been fortunate enough to have had the opportunity to go to Hajj on Hajj with you know, both my mother and my father separately, and then uh, twice of those occasions were were with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to ask you uh, which one was the most uh, enjoyable, but we could probably <laughs> come to that. But You know the thing is, is Hajj Hajj is you know not too long away now. Um, okay, yeah, you know there's this COVID and stuff like, that, but that doesn't take away from the the blessings of Hajj, the 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 time of Hajj, um, and these te- blessed you know nine ten days as well. But also, you know, there's so much to speak about Hajj itself uh, from different angles. But if I'm just gonna you know just ask you, bro, you know, to you, you know, I'm not gonna say what's so special about Hajj because there's many many things that are special. But to you, um, what's in your opinion? What you what you experience and stuff like? What was so special about Hajj? Um, big question. I know, big question. But you know, let's let's start off somewhere, and then I'm sure we can. Uh, we're going to start off in. somewhere. I mean, to be honest, uh, I mean, you know, there's. I, I'm going to give a, a a rational answer to this, and 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 an emotional one, uh, if I may. And you know, for me. Hajj was an obligation like any other. It's like salah, uh, like fasting during Ramadan. It's you know obeying my Creator. My Creator has ordered me that I must do Hajj once in my lifetime. So there was this, uh, there's this rational issue, if you like, where I have to just go there to fulfill my obligation. When you're there, uh, you do get um, overwhelmed. With with a lot of emotions that just come with being in that environment, uh, whereby people do talk about it as being a life changing experience, uh, and and I could talk about many many of these. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Hajj is one of those places where you see how Islam breaks down racial and geographical barriers. You know, every single person there is is my brother and my sister, and you see that relationship just naturally how Muslims are with each other without the distractions of life, and you see it manifest in life, and this is what life should be like when when there aren't the distractions of you know getting caught up in the rat race. So there's so there's that there's you know the actual um, the actual days of Hajj itself when we're staying in Mina. Uh, you know, you, you're dressed the same as everyone else, or you know, you're 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 uh, li- you're, you're laying on on the ground of Musdalifa, uh, looking up in the sky, and you realize how insignificant we are as creation, uh, in the grand scheme of things, and therefore, you know, we are insignificant, and the one who created us is the significant one, and and it really just draws you back to how much we need Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, both in this life and the next, um. But I think, I think a lot of this is when we're taken out of the environment that we're in, as in living a normal and everyday life with the distractions. We're in an environment where it is purely based upon that link that we have with the Creator. 
it draws it back to reality as to why we are here. And I think that's why it has a great impact on people's lives. Yeah, no, no, 100%, bro. I mean, there's so much you, you've mentioned there. And, and from from my point of view, to be honest with you, like, like you said, Hajj is something which, as Muslims, when you get to a certain age, when you have the means, this is an obligation. And unfortunately, I do see it in our times where uh, it's changed a lot now because a lot of young people go, but there was a time in, in the in the past. And I, it was probably because people couldn't afford it until they got older. But there was a lot of times where people... They went to Hajj late um, and later on in their lives and, you know, they sort of delayed it. And the reality is, is from the Sharia point of view, you know, if you, you know, if you, if Hajj is now obligatory upon you, there's no reason for you to delay it unless you have a, a valid reason. And also, I'd like to add that when I went to Hajj and I experienced it, obviously, with you side by side, shoulder to shoulder, uh, shoulder to shoulder, you know, I realized this is a young person's game, to be honest with you, because it, oh, it, 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 it was very demanding. So, you know, my, I always told people, you know, people say to me, I'm going to go to Umrah, you know, sound day out and stuff like that. I say, listen, you ain't going to sound out anything because what you do on <laughs> Hajj, you don't actually even do that. You know, you, you don't do that whilst you're in Umrah. But one thing I want to touch upon uh, is before going into some of the experiences and, you know, some some of the, the emotional stuff is the, the what you mentioned about unity, bro, is... Whether it was Hajj, whether it was Umrah when we went in Ramadan, you know, when you go there, and you made a fantastic point when you're out of your uh, uh, out of the rat race, out of the out of the uh, you know living a life where you might think you're better than someone else, or you will step on someone to get to achieve what you want to get. Right? It's a rat race. Everyone's competing. When you go there, and you see white people, black people, Chinese people. You know, people from all over the world, okay? Whether it was in, whether it was just, just think about in Ramadan, Afi, you know the score. We used to, you know, we used to have food on us. We used to go towards the masjid to sit there for Maghrib and break our fast. We used to distribute the food by the time we got there. But when we got there, you used to be like dragged and pulled by people who wanted you to sit with them to break yeah. their fast with their food. And the amazing thing is, these are people that normally you look at and think, this guy is from, <coughs> from, from poverty or he's from Africa, right? It didn't matter. And when it was a Hajj, when you were doing all the things that you needed to do, whether it was you were walking towards, you know, the Jamarat, i.e. Uh, to stone the, uh, the Jamarat, or whether it was Amina, or whether it was, like you said, it was Muzdalifa, you looked around and all you saw were people wearing the same two white cloths, right? And the status was the same. And the amazing thing is you would have had people there from billionaires to people who were in, in, the, in, in, a lot, in poverty. But it didn't matter because you were there now on, in the plains of Arafat or, or Muzdalifa. And to me, the way it always felt to me was that this is like, you know how in Christianity you have a confession box, right? Yeah. And you sit there and you... It was like as if everyone's on the same level. And it's yeah. like you said, like you said, it's just, it, you feel insignificant. Everyone's the same. You're not better than anyone. And you're just there to worship your creator. And that is something which, and just look at a few days ago, man, you know, with, with the, uh, with the uh, Euros. Uh, people were supporting players. Soon as there were some mistakes and penalties were missed, right? All this bigotry and racism came out, right? So for a moment, there could have been some sort of like unity based on football or stuff like that. But in reality, look how many divisions there are. Look how many, look how much discriminations there are. People are divided upon superficial lines. And what I experienced, and, and just to give it back to you, my brother, because you mentioned it, was when I was at Hajj, when I was at Umrah, you did not experience that. And that's the only place actually in my, in my entire, not even like, you go to Pakistan, you see dis discrimination between people. But the only time I experienced uh, a, a scenario where you didn't you didn't judge someone by their status or by their color was at uh, Hajj and at Umrah in that land, and, and that is something which is an amazing feeling, as you can you know, as you can uh, testify. Yeah, man. Um, I, I was once asked by someone. Um, 
and, 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 and there was an English guy who, you know, doing Dawah too, and um, you know, intellectually now he was becoming convinced that Islam, Islam is 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 true, and he said to me, he goes, why is it that you could grow up with an English person or a non-Muslim all your life and regard them as a friend, but you can meet someone who's a Muslim for the very first time and automatically you have a stronger bond with this person you've just met. And I was mm. reflecting on this and I couldn't answer why we have it. I know, I know, what, I know where it emanates from. It emanates from the Islamic Akida. But if you had to explain why you've got such a strong relationship with someone else, you can't. Because it's it's innate within, in, within us once we have this Akita. And Hajj is an excellent scenario where you see this manifest in the entire three and a half million odd people who are there for that purpose. You know, you are you are shoulder to shoulder with people in prayer. Uh, you know, people are there trying to serve you in uh, supporting you in fulfilling uh, your obligation and uh, doing recommended acts. Like when you're doing tawaf or you're doing, um, you know, uh, you're in between Safa Marwa and there's people there just pouring glasses of water, passing them to you to help for, rehyd- uh, for you to rehydrate purely because they want to support you and they get the reward as well. And they are seeing it as, you know, worshipping their creator, but supporting their their fellow Muslim brother at the same time. So, you know, I mean, I it, it does come down to people realizing what their purpose in life is. They might not be able to articulate it, but they realize they are there to worship their creator. Um, and we are all united in that mission. I mean, I just want to give a, a beautiful example. My favorite, favorite place, just to go and chill out, if you like, where I just go and spend hours, was the top floor of the haram. Uh, in Mecca and mm. I just used to observe just used to look down at what, what looked like chaos with people doing tawaf uh, you know you know, it was packed and you're saying right there's three and a half you know there's millions of people here but as soon as that adhan starts you see what looks like chaos organise itself meticulously into rows tidy rows ready to pray to their lord and, mm. you know, I urge everyone just, to, it's, it's an amazing sight. And you really, really do appreciate the power of the thing that we follow. Yeah, man. And to be honest with you, what, what I used to, what I used to, to a lot of people is, because as you know, we, we've traveled the world a bit, haven't we? And uh, what I used to tell people yeah. is no matter whatever place I've been to, and this could be obviously people could say, well, it's subjective. Um, but that scene, what you're saying when you're looking down from the top floor uh, of to people doing the tawaf, that scene is, you know, you've got that hum in the background, mm, I, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. Yeah. And I, you know, I'll, I'll give you my experience from the top floor. I remember once I was on the top floor uh, in the harem, right? And I heard the adhan kicked in. And you know, when the adhan kicks in, obviously there's other mosques around there as well, isn't there? And like, and if you, yeah. look, if you go to, if you go to uh, Mecca uh, where the mosque is, you see that there's all these mountains around there. And when it came to the a bit where it said, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, right? Uh, that, you know, I bear witness that, you know, uh, the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah. And it, it, like, it sort of bounced, bounced like uh, yeah. along the mountains. And you know what I thought came in my mind, bro? I thought to myself, I thought this was the place almost 1400 years ago, right? Where the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam called the people to the mountain, and he said that if I was to tell you that um, uh, an army was coming from behind this mountain, would you believe me? They said yes, but then they rejected him. Right? He was, you know, he struggled in Mecca. The people like Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, all these people, they fought him. And you know what I thought, bro? I thought, look at look at it now. How amazing it is. That who talks about Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, uh, Utbah ibn Rabia, but the name of the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is still bouncing around the mountains of Mecca today. Uh-huh. You know, Allah, yeah. You know, just think about that. That the vic- and this is the victory that he was telling them about. This is the victory that he was telling yeah. them about. That he was promising them about, right? And it just goes to show and. 
you know that it was just an amazing, it was an amazing feeling, man. But you know, also as well, it's uh, a bit of a funny point. I don't know how you felt about this, but you know, uh, before you went the first time, people might have told yeah. you about when you see the Kaaba, you need to make a, a dua first. Don't look at it. Don't look at it until you get close. Yeah. And when you look at you need to make a dua. You know, throughout my youth, I always had a desire of of going there, right? And uh, I used to have these like dreams or thoughts, like I'm gonna see the Kaaba. I'm going to collapse. I'm just going to, yeah. you know, just go crazy, right? And so I remember going with the group now. And I think this is I think this is down to jet lag. I'm going to be honest with you, right? So I'm going with the group now. We're walking, walking. I'm mindful thinking, look down. Don't look up. Don't look up. Get to the end. Look up. So walking, walking, walking. Walk to the front. And I looked up and I saw the car, man. And it was huge, right? It was It was bigger than I thought. But, you know, it was like, alhamdulillah. You know, you know that that feeling of that I was thinking I'm just gonna start yeah. bawling, I'm gonna start crying, I'm gonna yeah. faint and start. It never happened, but it was strange because, you know, it was one of those things that it didn't happen the way I envisioned it. But still, when you see it and you make that first du'a, um, it's something which I, I I'm sure it's gonna be a case with every single person. I will always remember remember that first sight because you know. Just say now you're, you're, you are where you are, I am where I am, right? Think about it when we're going to pray Salah. If we're going to pray Salah. Between, what do we, what, what's our intention? That we're praying towards facing the Kaaba, right? But we yeah. have wa- walls, we have cities, we have oceans, right? But now here you are, man. There's no barrier. You know what I mean? It's amazing, man. The, it, it's a funny one. And I think... People shouldn't feel disheartened if they don't cry or they don't have that overwhelming emotion when when they see the Kaaba for the first time because the experience of Hajj is going to hit you in different ways. I mean, mm. and like I said, you know, my, uh, I, I regard myself as perhaps too rational at times and I didn't have that experience when I saw the Kaaba. However, I had a very, I felt like it was a very surreal experience, like I was watching it on TV and I, was, like, I had to kid myself, you know, is this real? Uh, but I didn't have that overwhelming of emotion. However, there were a few times where it hit me like, whoa. And, and mm. um, you know, and I could give you, I could give you each of those examples. Um, the first one was when I went into um, the cave of um, Hira. Hira, Hira, yeah. Hira, and, and um, I sat in there. And whoa, man, there, there was something about being in there that, gave me this eerie feeling not in a bad way but like mm. i could feel something happening inside my stomach where something in fact there's another there's another place as well that happened where something big has happened here and and i don't know why i had that feeling there rather than other places and you know that was that place where Muhammad sallam received uh sallam, sallam. revelation Muhammad sallam received revelation for the first time and then um that same feeling i had when I was sitting near uh, the grave of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I was looking over toward that place and thinking, you know, man, that the greatest person to have ever walked on this earth is buried there. And that gave me that feeling. And then uh, the other place I had it was when, when we went to uh, Badr. Mm. You, you're driving yeah. in, you're seeing the mountains. And it's like, you know, it, it, it reminds me of that scene out of, um, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings where you see those ghosts coming in over, like, just wiping everyone out. But, you mm. know, for me, I could feel people coming over the mountains. It's like I could see them. You, it, it, you know, it's like the scenes of the message are coming to life for me. Uh, and it's hard to explain why we get it. But there's something special about these places, man. And uh, we, can't, uh, we can't belittle that. But it is going to re- result in a different feeling for different people. Yeah, sure. I think also as well is obviously you know like the obligation side of it. That's that's no doubt you're doing it purely for the worship of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But I also feel like you know, uh, you know, because because where I used to, I used to think before going there when I was a youngster or whatever, I used to think like I just want to stand somewhere where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam may have stood, mm. right? You know, that's the sort of mindset. But you know, when you go there. And it's very, very, it's, it's, it's very modernized. Um, commercialized, isn't it? It's very commercialized. And I think that also maybe because normally, you know, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a historian, right? 
and you go to certain places and you, and when you go and see a fort or you go to an old house or a mansion, you try to get, you know, you get that vibe, you get that feeling, that fascination, that, wow, you know, and you can see how old it is and you can, you know, you, you get that, you can sense it in that way, right? But when you go there, it's like, it's like what is actually there from that time. And I think there's very little there uh, from that time. And that's why I think it's very important to preserve uh, a lot of sites and stuff, which obviously, you know, the current regime there uh, thinks, uh, you know, in an opposite way. But just, just to add, you mentioned uh, the Prophet's mosque, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and the only thing I want to mention about that really is because, because it's not a part of Hajj as such, but that is something which, you know, I might not have cried at, um, in, in Mecca, but as you know, because obviously you was there, you know, it was, it was when, when, when going to uh, give salam to the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and, and going to the grave and stuff, uh, that was something which was incredible, man. And 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 you know, you know how I used to feel because um, obviously, after you know, we we sort of we grew up together, and obviously, you know, everyone's got their own checkered past, and and you know the score, right? But I'm there thinking, you know, what have I done in my life to be blessed enough to to be this close to the grave of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, you know, things like that, which really used to fill me with a lot of emotion. The fact that, you know, you know, th- to thank you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, you know, I, I'm, you know, the scum of the earth in my, in my mind, and, and I'm being given such an opportunity, and, and that's something which I will never, ever, ever forget uh, in my life. And, it's, and, you know, and, and another thing as well, just to add, bro, is, you know, there's over, you know, uh, almost 2 billion Muslims in the world. And the reality is, is, if you think about it, how many people actually get the opportunity to go there because of financial reasons or whatever. So to be part of the ones you have is just an amazing, it's just a, it's just a blessing, bro. Um, and you know, the thing is, is one thing I like, I'm just going to say one thing, one thing, Afi, and uh, you know, one thing that when I came back from the first time I did Hajj, it occurred to me, but it didn't at the time was, you know, you know, this, uh, this thing of like, if your Hajj is accepted, then you come, you're, you're like a newborn baby. Um, yeah. A lot, a lot of people play on that. And it's true. It's, an, it's, a, it's, you could say, you could argue it's an incentive. It never occurred to me until, you know, until I came back and I realized, actually, if it's being accepted, wow, you know, it puts me in a good place. Yeah. Right. But it's like, uh, it wasn't like, it wasn't to me, it wasn't my primary objective. And I think it goes back to what you were saying before. It was an obligation that you needed to do. I didn't feel, I didn't feel I was any special than anyone else. I didn't want people, uh, you know, to call me Haji because look, it's just someone which is a personal thing between me and Allah. And I did it. And, and you know, if he accepts it, then hopefully it'll be, you know, in my interest in, on the day of judgment. I think, I mean, this is where I was going to say, look, we need to bring this back to reality a bit. Well, I think a lot of focus is put on Hajj and people talk about uh, the five pillars and Hajj being one of that is once in a lifetime experience. Um, and uh, a lot of emphasis is put on this, like it's the obligation of all obligations. And, and you know, there are going to be some people who are not fortunate enough to see it, but they're fortunate in other ways because the obligation perhaps is not upon them because they don't have the means or they're not physically capable of doing it. We sure. need to remind ourselves that although there's a lot of virtues for Hajj and there's a lot of blessings, we've got to worship our creator in every aspect of our life and don't mm. negate everything else that we have to do in our everyday life where we do get distracted where sometimes, you know, we, 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 we belittle someone or, you know, we react badly to a brother when we're, you know, driving in the car. Uh, and, and it's the destruction of life. It's, 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 the, it's the corruption around us that's changing our personalities. But we should not behave in a different way when we're here or than when we do on Hajj. And this is why that experience, if you are fortunate enough to have it, bring it back to your life. You know, don't let that buzz last a month, two months, three months, and then slowly you get back to your normal way of life. You know, I'm the same. You know, I'm, I'm speaking out of experience. You do feel that buzz dying slowly, you know, the longer it's been since you've come back. 
but you need to remind yourself that just like Hajj was an obligation where you have gone and you felt closer to your Creator, you will feel closer to your Creator when you worship Him in every aspect of your life. Yeah, hundred percent, bro. I could I could not say it better, man. I think I think that's that's really important because you're right. When when people come back, because one thing when you're on Hajj, you'll know the score. You do learn a lot of things because you are there for a little while and you, you learn to be patient and you know all these type of things. And look, like you're saying, we speak from uh, from from uh, experience because it's not like you know we haven't been involved in some sort of road rage or, or, or losing patience, but it is important. But it also goes to show that when you're in the right environment, it's easier to do that. And 100%. when you're not in the when you're not in the right environment, you know it's more difficult. But listen, inshallah, look. Afi man, there's so much to talk about, and we haven't got time. <laughs> whether it's whether it's the the uh, the beggars, the uh, the fraud beggars, shall I say? Um, whether it's you know the pain of uh, the uh, your thighs burning, uh, rubbing on each other, and you know I found out the <laughs> the, the the hard way about that. The hard way. And there's the, many the other mis- things, the, isn't there? The mission back from uh, doing that the war for uh, well. The Safa Marwa of uh, Eid, Hajj Day. Uh, there's so many, yeah. man. The missions to get back to your tent. Uh, we could probably spend a day talking about it. And maybe we should, maybe we should, man. But one thing I want to add, though, I think it's important. You know, when we, when we, uh, before we went to Hajj, Eid is a chilling day, isn't it? And I remember oh. you mentioned, you, I remember you mentioned it to me there as well that listen, Eid, don't think this Eid is going to be like any other Eid. <laughs> this is probably the most busiest day of Hajj. And I think that day, you know what? It'd, it'd be good to have uh, to one of these Apple watches or these GPS watches because you know what? We must have walked miles, bro. We must have walked miles just on that one day, man. But it's a, you know, it's an amazing. <coughs> bro, the whole day spent walking. The whole day, and you know, we were we were fortunate enough to have friends from there, so we we experienced eating al baked chicken at the Yambuk Beach. Uh, we went to Badr. <laughs> You know, we did things, other things as well, which uh, we'll keep ourselves. Um, but, but yeah, man, you know, inshallah, maybe, maybe you have to do another, another one of these before Hajj yourself. Share some, yeah, some I was just going to say the, that we've about five, six days. Let's, let's do another one or another two just to, you know, give people that insight as to what would be happening on these days if they were there. Yeah, sure. No, no, definitely, man. No, definitely, definitely. Cool, bro. Listen, anyway, listen, let's, 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 call, let's leave it at that. Unless there's anything you want to add at the end. No, 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 respect, bro. Um, I think, oh, you good, know, yeah. the one message I would give everyone is, you know, uh, there's a lot of learning from Hajj. You know, do it while you are young. I think the message that you said there is do it while you are long, mm. young. Uh, learn from that experience and apply it to your life. Just look at it with a different mind when you go there. Enjoy the, the virtues of it, but try to understand why they're there. You know, you are no different from the person who's here, who's just gone there, and why, what is it about that environment, about being surrounded by like-minded people that changes you? Yeah, definitely, man. And the only, the, the final two points that I've sort of triggered off your final points that I want to say is that one thing that, uh, one thing that gave me that, uh, a better experience, shall I say, of Hajj was because I already had some uh, understanding of, of Islam in the sense of the history, the seerah, what happened, the struggles of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa stuff like that. So, you know, when you're there, it, that sort of comes to life. Um, yeah. That these, this is, you know, this place here, this is, where this is where this happened. This is where this happened. This is where the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa was struggling and, you know, Safa, Marwa, it all comes to life. And, you know, like you said, that I'm not going to say uh, example of ghosts at, uh, uh, in the movie of Lord of the Rings, but certainly <laughs> it comes to life. And one last point I want to mention, Afi, uh, building on your point, is that I heard once uh, a narration. It was on the radio. I can't remember whether there was a hadith or whether there was just commentary of a of a scholar who was saying that if a Muslim has the ability and uh, Hajj now has become wajib obligatory upon him, if he dies without going Hajj, i.e., where he's where he's deliberately um, not done it right. Deliberately, he's delayed it. Then you know he dies no different to uh, a disbeliever. Now take from that what you want. What you want. That's not literally, but the emphasis is on there. That yeah, I know that... a lot of us want to make money. We want to be big on TikTok and businesses and stuff like that. Get married and nice cars. 
But listen, if you can do all of that with your money, do what you need to do first, go and make the pilgrimage, then after that, you'll understand what's more important in life anyway. But okay, 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 man, just, yeah. just on that point, before we close, yeah, I, think I just want to yeah, add man. another really important point. Because, you know, when I talk about Hajj with a lot of people, they mm. say, oh, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I've got to go when I'm ready. There is no perfect time. The perfect time is now. The perfect time is when you got that first opportunity. Don't wait for a magical moment. We're, we're human beings. We're never going to be perfect. There's this utopian world that you're looking for when you want to get to that state is never going to happen. So the sooner you go, the better, irrespective of you know how practicing or not you are. This is an obligation. Your your debt to your Lord. Mm. Fulfill it. Yeah, man. Banging, bro. Banging. Cool, man. Anyway, listen. Jazakallah khair for joining me on this, bro. And Jazakallah for the people listening. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed it and benefited from it. Um, and uh, we certainly did uh, from this discussion, man, and reminiscing some old times. But let's leave it at that feed. Zakal Hara, we'll speak soon. Barakabi. Speak to you soon. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.